Hi everyone and welcome to the second in what is our invasive species webinar series that is co-hosted by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio Sea Grant College program. Uh, we're glad you're here to join us this morning, this Wednesday morning uh, for the second in our series. In case you missed it last week, um, the first episode in our series was on a general overview of aquatic invasive species animals and plants in Ohio. Um, that will be archived at the bottom of this slide here. You can see there's a webinar link to the Ohio DNR YouTube page. That past webinar and all future webinars, including today's webinar, will be archived there. And you can find those and lots more great educational videos on ODNR's um, YouTube page. We want to thank Alyssa Yapel, who will be our producer in the background today. If you see her chiming in, uh, feel free to use the Q&A box at any time during today's webinar. If you have questions for our speakers um, or if you would like more information on any of the topics that we're talking about today. My name is Sarah Orlando and I am with the Ohio Clean Marinas program. Uh, a partnership through Ohio Sea Grant, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and the Lake Erie Marine Trades Association. So we welcome you today to uh, learn about Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, which is a little bit more deep dive into some of our aquatic invasive species and the reasons and ways you as Ohioans can take part in helping to prevent their spread. So I'm going to switch over here to our first speaker, um, I'll be the second one. <laughs> um, our first speaker, Tori Gabriel, who is the Ohio Sea Grant uh, program leader and the fisheries extension educator uh, for Ohio Sea Grant. He'll be kicking us off here today. So want to remind you uh, the next webinars in the series through the rest of July and early August are mentioned here. So please make sure you uh, follow us on Facebook and some of the events and uh, tune in to the future webinars that we have uh, in next week and in future weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Get my slides up here. All right, everybody. So as Sarah said, we're going to learn a bit about aquatic invasive species and how and why we should try to prevent them. I'm the Extension Program Leader and Fisheries Educator for Ohio Sea Grant, and so you'll see a lot of fish themes because I like fish. Uh, who doesn't? So what are aquatic invasive species? Um, there's a lot of words on that slide and that definition, but really the two major things are the highlighted there. It's any species that is non-native, so it's not supposed to be in this ecosystem, but it also causes some kind of harm, and that can be environmental, it could be the human health, um, but it has to cause harm before it's invasive. There are organisms that get here that are non-native that don't necessarily cause harm and so they're not considered invasive but those really harmful ones that kind of take over environments uh, are, are the ones that we consider invasive some impacts so why we should care about these things a lot of times their impacts to the environment are irreversible um, that's a big part of biodiversity loss. That's a bad thing. Uh, the more diverse it is out there in the environment, the better able it is to withstand things and rebound from, from other impacts. Um, huge impacts to food webs are really a, a big part of it. So you think of things like zebra mussels we'll talk about in a little bit, and that's that middle picture um, that, that's inside of a water intake pipe. They totally clogged it. But a bigger issue probably is the fact that they eat algae, which is low on the food web in, in Lake Erie. So they're taking over all of that food. They're kind of taking that food away from everything else that lives in the environment. And that's just one example. Um, obviously, there's huge economic impacts associated with that. Over $100 billion in the US alone, um, trillions when you get out to the world. Um, potential risk to human health because they can bring diseases and pesticides uh, used to, to combat them can also harm human health in some cases. Uh, and of course, cultural. So those of us that like to recreate out on the lake um, see our, our environment changing, uh, and it's usually not things that we're used to, and sometimes it directly impacts those, those things we like to do best. So how do they get here? Um, there's multiple ways. Uh, this is a few of the main categories. There's probably some more side categories, um, but whatever way it is, it always involves human health. 
Um, so one of the big ones over the years has been ballast water. Uh, we'll go into a little bit in depth into these in a second, so I'll, I'll kind of breeze through the major categories here right now. Uh, another one is removal of natural barriers. So some of you may recognize that top picture as Niagara Falls. Um, one is intentional stocking, and yes, that is a goldfish in an aquarium, so intentional stocking. Uh, involves the release of pets, um, so please never ever release your pets. And then accidental stocking, where you're you're purposefully stocking a good species maybe, but uh, there could be one kind of hitchhiking that you're not aware of and that uh, that gets spread to a, a new body of water. So first up, ballast water. How how does that how does that work in the shipping industry? So. A lot of times we have uh, big freighter ships that come from the other side of the world, literally, and so they have to, to take on a lot of water into these tanks. And you can see that that picture on the right uh, has a description of the, the ballast water tanks on those ships. So they take water on. A lot of times these are freshwater ports. unfortunately uh, could carry invasive species. A lot of organisms got here, invasive organisms got to the Great Lakes through this. Um, recently there's been more um, of a push on legislation and things like swishing, uh, they call it swish and spit. Uh, they fill up those tanks with salt water before they enter the Great Lakes system and that helps to kill the majority of the organisms that are in there. So we've actually done a good job of tamping down on this particular one, but some major invaders you might have heard of are zebra and quagga mussels that probably got in through that ballast water exchange pathway. Uh, another one that likely came in that way is the round goby. So if you guys have, if any of you have fished on Lake Erie or in the area, uh, you probably would have caught these guys if you were fishing near the bottom. They're everywhere. Um, they like to eat our native fish eggs. Uh, and things like smallmouth bass uh, and largemouth bass uh, have a hard time. They like to guard their nests, and if you catch one off the nest, the nest usually gets eaten up by these guys because brown gobies are just kind of everywhere on the bottom of the lake now. Uh, the second major category was barrier removal. So again, that's Niagara Falls, and then you can see a map of, of the canal systems from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. And those obviously didn't used to exist. So um, fish and, and boats and any other organisms could not get up Niagara Falls naturally. So it was a, a natural barrier against invasives that may have gotten all the way up to Lake Ontario, but they couldn't get over Niagara Falls. Um, but for shipping, uh, we wanted to, the colloquial we, uh, wanted to be able to get around that. So once we were able to get ships through those canal systems, fish and other organisms were able to come up with those ships uh, or swim up on their own. And so that's things like the sea lamprey, which you've probably heard of. They have that kind of wicked look at mouth. Um, they latch on to our native species of fish and they will um, eat up to 40 pounds of fish during its lifetime. So they can be pretty devastating. And this is one where it's really heavily controlled throughout the Great Lakes because without that, uh, we probably would not have the fisheries we all know and love. Um, another one is white perch. Again, if you fish in Lake Erie, you've probably seen a lot of white perch. They are actually native to the east coast, um, but they got up through those canal systems as well. Um, they eat fish eggs. They compete with things like white bass and our other native species, um, so they can cause some damage as well. Intentional stocking. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this can include the aquarium trade um, or lease or escape of classroom and lab animals. So please, if you do have aquariums or if you're a teacher or if you know any of them, please never, ever, ever release those pets or organisms into the environment. A lot of times, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times people think they're saving that one fish's life and it's pretty innocuous, but you can see I'm holding a goldfish in that picture that's pretty big. Um, that was uh, sampling a, a wetland location here in Ottawa County, and there were lots of these goldfish and they get bigger than that. So they, they actually, look harmless in your aquarium, but once they're in the native environments here, they, they root up the good native aquatic vegetation, which provides habitat and food for a lot of our native fish and other organisms. So even something as innocuous as a goldfish can cause huge damage. Again, there's the goldfish, but goldfish are actually really similar uh, to common carp. They're closely related uh, and they do very similar things in the environment. And 
Common carp are actually an interesting story as well. Uh, they were actually intentionally released in the late 1800s by the government as a food and sport fish. Um, nowadays, people uh, are kind of more focused on things like walleye and yellow perch around here anyways as food fish. So uh, these guys kind of been relegated to the invasive species, uh, less desired role for most people. And um, it's not just animals, right? We also have invasive plants. So another one that probably got into the aquarium trade is hydrilla. Uh, it's a neat looking plant, but it can cause these huge dense stands that completely outcompete all of our native uh, vegetation. And it can actually clog waterways so you can't really ride your boats uh, through them without getting your motors all clogged up uh, or even paddles if you're on a paddle craft. And then the last major category I'll talk about is accidental stocking. Uh, so this could include escape from ponds, things like aquaculture or facilities or nurseries or even home water gardens. Uh, so all those things are perfectly fine to do and do them responsibly, but you have to make sure that they're not draining into a native waterway. Um, this could also include dumping unused fishing baits. So a lot of times bait can come from southern farms and that we're not always 100% sure what's in those. Uh, I know that there have been studies and most of those studies show that those bait dealers are doing the right thing, but uh, one could slip through and sometimes that's all it takes. So never dump your unused fishing bait. If you're using minnows or other live fish, uh, you can freeze them and then use them thawed out. That actually works pretty well. Uh, or you can just dump them in the trash and even night crawlers. Night crawlers are not native to this area. So if you're done with your worms, uh, they don't really freeze well. So just toss them in the trash if you're not going to use them again. Um, an interesting example of kind of both accidental and intentional stocking is uh, what we've been calling Asian carps, but you may have seen are now going to be termed invasive carps. Um, they are invasive. There's a group of usually four when you hear the word Asian carps that that usually is four different species. And they were actually intentionally stocked into aquaculture ponds, but then accidentally escaped uh, multiple times and got into the Mississippi River drainage and have caused all kinds of problems. Um, so just real quick, the, the species that we normally talk about are the big head carp and the silver carp. If you've seen videos of them jumping or you saw those pictures on the last slide, the silver carp is the one that jumps. Uh, but both of them are filter feeders. And so much like I mentioned about zebra mussels, they eat the algae on the bottom of the food chain. Uh, and so they're essentially taking the food away from all of our other organisms that live in these environments. The other two species of, of invasive carps uh, have a little bit different impacts because they feed differently. So black carp is not yet in Ohio. Um, it's coming up the Mississippi uh, slower than the other species, but it eats mollusks, so things like snails and mussels. And that's bad because uh, our native mussels are one of the most imperiled groups of, of organisms around. Uh, they're really neat, they're really diverse, and they're in a lot of trouble. So seeing these guys come up trying to eat those types of organisms isn't a great thing. Uh, and then the last one is grass carp. And if you own a pond, you might have heard of these as uh, white aimer. Uh, they're allowed in Ohio if they're triploid. That means they cannot spawn. Um, but there is unfortunately a diploid population, which means they can spawn uh, in the Lake Erie drainage basin. So we know that they have spawned and in years where we have big rains in the spring at the right time, we do see spawning of grass carp. So um, the Division of Wildlife and Partners are working really, really hard to try to control that population so that they don't cause lots of damage. As the name implies, grass carp, they will eat the, the stringy vegetation uh, before other things. So they're not going to eat our harmful algae blooms or anything like that, but they actually cause a lot of damage to uh, things like our native wetland areas where our good green vegetation is growing. So to the what can you do part of things, I'm going to come back and kind of show you a little bit of how to use this guide. But uh, we partnered with the Division of Wildlife and Ohio State University Extension uh, to uh, do an Ohio version of a guide that was originally developed by Pennsylvania Sea Grant. So, uh, it's a really cool resource, um, and like I said, we'll go through it, but this helps you identify potential invasive species, tell you whether or not uh, you should report it, um, because if it's something that's everywhere, we don't really need to report it because we know, uh, but if it's a newer species and it's not throughout the state, then it's definitely worth reporting. And it tells you how to do that, where to do that, and all kinds of other good, 
good information. So we'll come back to this in a second. Uh, again, there's a there's a national program called Habitatitude. It's really all about being a responsible pet owner. So never release your pets or plants. Uh, and you have a, a variety of alternatives to just flat out releasing them. Um, so getting back in touch for your re to your retailer to to figure out because they have answers a lot of times for that, or working with other aquarists or pond owners to kind of give back or trade back with each other. And you can donate these things. Uh, if it's things like plants, you can just seal them up in plastic bags and toss them in the trash so you're sure they're not getting to your waterways. Uh, and if it's animal organisms, you can contact a vet or a pet retailer for how to humanely dispose of those if it comes to that. Again, that might sound a little cruel, but um, one animal, for instance, is, is a lot less harmful than releasing it into the wild and having, you know, a whole population of native species suffer. Uh, and one of the most impactful things you could do is get a kid outside. This slide says take a kid fishing. So these are my own kids and my nephews. We try to get out on the water. And like I said at the beginning, we like to fish. So that's our thing. But if you like to paddle or swim or sail or whatever it is, just getting kids out uh, and, and getting them on the water so that they learn to care about this resource and really start to understand why it's worth, um, why it's worth protecting is, is really a huge thing. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. I can get to that button and then I'm going to show you real quick before we toss it back to Sarah, this invasive species guide. So I think Alyssa is going to be able to share a link to this guide in the chat um, and that you can download this yourself. Obviously, it's not going to be in the spiral bound form like I'm holding here, but this entire book is online and you can actually print it and, and bind it yourself if you would like, or you can use it as a PDF. Uh, but it's got a lot of information again about prevention. Uh, we've got three major um, areas. One of them is on plants and you can even see like uh, identification information for various plants so it can help you if you've got a plant that you're wondering if it's invasive. Oh, it helps you with terminology and things like that. Uh, we have a section on sorry I've got these tags but they're sticking we have a section on invertebrates and then we have a section on fish as well and so all of them have sections on anatomy and what exactly you're looking for um, and big species accounts uh, two page species accounts and one example of that is let's say you are fishing at your favorite lake and you find these guys. So those are zebra mussels, but let's say you were pretty sure you see these little mussels and you see some stripes on them. So you can get this guide and you can look up the page on zebra mussels. And there is a picture there. There's a couple pictures so you can kind of see. Yeah, those look similar, but we also have sections on the species at a glance. We have a section on identification. Um, we have similar species, so sometimes it is a little difficult to discern between a native and an invasive. Uh, we have habitat that they like to that they like to live in, the ways that they can spread, and then lastly their distribution. And beside distribution, you can see down there at the bottom corner we have a map of Ohio, and all of those orange highlighted counties are the ones that we know we have r records of zebra mussels. Um, and below that is the continental US with a similar thing for states. So you can see kind of the distribution across the country and in Ohio as well. Um, this one is pretty ubiquitous throughout Ohio. So we don't have a button on there that says report, uh, but let me flip through to, for instance, the big head carp. So if you see something that you think is a big head carp and you look that up, you can actually see that little phone icon with a red button on it. And that's just an indicator that tells you that that's a species we would like you to report. So if there's a species that you find that we want you to report, there will be an indicator there, that phone. And again, that key is in this guide. So that's the Ohio Field Guide to Aquatic Invasive Species. Um, you can download it yourself online. Uh, and I think it's a very useful tool. And I know a lot of people that think it's it's good just to read, even if you're not using it as an identification tool. But um, 
let me know if you have any questions on that. I'm happy to discuss further. And with that, I think I will toss it back to Sarah Orlando. Thanks, Tori. Um, I want to check with Alyssa to see if any questions have come in. OK, perfect. Thanks, Alyssa. I want to remind everyone this is meant to be interactive, so feel free if you missed a chance to send a question to Tori. He's going to stay on for the rest of today's webinar, so feel free to put in any questions or comments that you have in the Q&A box. And then I'm now going to shift to sharing some tips on how you as a recreational water user, or if you have any friends, family, or colleagues that are recreational water users, uh, can do your part to really um, take some of what Tori shared and become engaged in pre uh, preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, so same with me, feel free to use the Q&A if you have questions or follow up or you're looking for more information on a specific um, part of my presentation. So great, thanks Tori. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if this works. All right. Now, so I'm going to try this one more time. I'm getting light up. There we go. Does that work? Can you see it okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, so as I said, my name is Sarah Orlando. I am with the Ohio Clean Marinas program. So for those of you who are not familiar with our program, I just wanted to share a little bit briefly about who we are and what we do. Um, I have one of three staff who are stationed across Ohio to serve the recreational boating community in the aspect of what we call clean boating. Um, so many of you are likely aware of either the um, ODNR Division of Parks and Watercraft uh, or your local maybe power squadron or US Coast Guard Auxiliary or other partners who do a lot of education and outreach and prevention on safe boating to make sure that we are doing our part to um, be good boaters in that way and um, hopefully keep ourselves safe and others safe while we're on the water. Our mission is a counterpart to that safe boating initiative in that we want to uh, encourage also responsible boating as it went in respect to our environment. Um, so the idea is to have an all around good, responsible uh, recreating activity where you are safe on the water, um, but that you are also practicing what we call clean boating. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, we have a voluntary certification based program for marinas called the Ohio Clean Marinas Program. And we recognize marinas across the state of Ohio for doing their part to prevent um, invasive species spread, uh, prevent marine debris, prevent pollution into our waterways. Um, and what I love about it is marinas are often the last chance any sorts of pollution has to be intercepted uh, before it reaches our waterways. So a lot of times we work with our marinas not only to address what's being done on site at their facility, but also to handle the runoff that they're receiving from the surrounding community or neighboring areas. So they're doing oftentimes well above what is required of them by law and what um, is specifically on their property. Um, so we want to acknowledge the hard work that they're doing um, and uh, we are always willing to help marinas, whether they're a part of our program or if they're interested in learning more. Um, our program and our program staff serve to offer technical assistance and guidance on any environmental regulations or environmental best practices as it comes to marinas. So that's the Clean Marinas program. Something for those of you who may be, let me see if I can, there we go. For those of you who may be outside of Ohio tuning in, um, there are clean marina programs across the country, including all of the Great Lakes. Um, there is either a certification program or a environmental stewardship program related to clean boating in all of our Great Lakes states and, and territories. Um, so when we we actually have a, a partnership called the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network, 
And our motto is kind of basically wherever you are in the Great Lakes, please choose a clean marina, uh, support our marinas. Uh, if you do travel across or around the Great Lakes states, um, look up. Uh, there's lots of resources where you can find a clean marina near you. Um, there's actually, if you Google, there's a, there's a Great Lakes clean marina map um, where you can find a map of all the clean marinas across the Great Lakes. And so you can support these businesses um, for the good work that they're doing. Now for the Ohio Clean Voter Program. This is a way that you Ohioans and, and as citizens and recreational boaters or recreational water users um, can become engaged in protecting our waterways. Uh, this is a voluntary stewardship program uh, that is solely education based and we have a wealth of resources and information and even incentives, um, some giveaways uh, to recognize you for doing your part um, for Ohio's waterways. There's a couple links here that I believe Alyssa may share, but just so you're aware of them, um, there's a clean boater pledge link. Um, what that is, is basically uh, you can go online or if you see us out at a boat show or a public outreach event, uh, you can sign the pledge. Uh, it's it's very short basically, but it's hopefully engaging you in, in, in um, committing to do something like prevent the spread of invasive species, make sure you're uh, picking up trash if you're on or near the waterways, um, making sure you're fueling properly if you have a, a power boat or sailboat at the fuel dock and making sure drops of gasoline don't end up in the water um, and many more items. Uh, when you take that pledge, you become a part of what's called our Ohio Clean Boater Program and there's opportunities to join our e-newsletter, um, to follow us on Facebook and become engaged as part of this uh, kind of like smaller community. There's over 500,000 boaters in the state of Ohio and we hope more and more boaters um, join this program, learn about our waterways and, and become engaged in protecting them for future generations. Uh, we are available if there's any uh, professionals or natural resource um, agencies or partners on, on the webinar. We can conduct outreach at recreational boating events and other um, educational opportunities you may have where we can have a table or interact or provide a presentation on our clean boater initiatives and oftentimes we'll bring little giveaways and, and trinkets and things like that that are helpful um, such as reusable straws, um, we actually have mesh bags that are meant to be used as a as a tra a reusable trash bag if you find you know bottles, cans, things like that when you're on the water. Um, so feel free to contact us for more information. And the final thing I'll say about our clean boater program is we also have a clean marinas YouTube series. Um, many of the videos of which are specifically geared towards boaters and they're meant to be short snips um, minute to two minutes long uh, focused on specific topics like invasive species like sanding and painting your vessel um, like marine debris and they're either information for you boaters to check out and learn more um, on how you can be a clean boater or they're resources that you can share with others uh, about this program. All right, so now to delve specifically into stop aquatic hitchhikers and how that relates to clean boating. And I will say today we're, um, I, I work on recreational boating, but these practices apply to any recreational water user. So you'll see in these pictures here, um, whether you're a waterfowl hunter, a paddler, um, angler, um, you know, tubing, if, if you interact in the waterways, recreationally in any way, um, this is a campaign for you to be aware of. Um, so the, the there's a national campaign called Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers. You've heard it many times now. And the idea behind this is uh, aquatic invasive species specifically love to hitchhike. That's exactly the term that it's intentional. We have that term and they love to attach to all sorts of equipment that can be in the waterways or around the waterways um, get stuck in the nooks and crannies. And if you don't take certain steps, those aquatic invasives can literally hitchhike on your aquatic equipment, um, anything that you may have in the water to a new body of water if you do travel quite a bit or if you go from place to place. Um, so this is just some of the examples here of the types of users we're interested in with this campaign. Again, anglers, motorboats, paddlecraft, 
scuba divers and snorkelers, seaplane operators, waterfowl hunters, and swimmers. So if you fall into any of those categories or if you know somebody, um, please, uh, there's a link here. We encourage you to learn more about this campaign and how you can become involved and um, do your part to help prevent invasive spread. For marina managers and natural resource professionals that may be tuning in or maybe viewing this uh, webinar at some point, these are just some quick best practices that we recommend. Uh, we encourage you to contact us for more information and ways to partner with us. Um, I'll hold up here. I have one of our signs here that's in the picture. I think maybe you can see this. This is our um, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers uh, boat ramp sign. Through the Clean Marinas program, we actually provide these two marinas for free. Um, and we also have a partnership with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources for placing this at state park um, boat ramps. The idea is hopefully um, if there are anglers or uh, watercraft that go from body of water to body of water, especially fishing tournaments or things like that, where people may be traveling um, definitely outside of the watershed, uh, we hope that you see this, you're reminded um, to take certain steps uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about later to prevent the spread of invasives. So if you provide that signage, that's certainly a great first step. Even better is something like providing training workshops, educating your boaters about aquatic invasive species. Uh, the Clean Marinas program or any of our partners that are in this webinar series can, can help you with that, or we can connect you with the people who can. Um, and then the best case scenario would be uh, actually having some sort of a wash pad or a power washing service that's available to boaters. A good example of this is um, we can actually partner together to uh, host a, a boat washing station uh, that is meant to rinse off any aquatic invasives that may get stuck in nook and crannies of vessels um, if there is a fishing tournament. So for example, we could set up a, a temporary boat wash area where you pull off the boat ramp, um, have a wash down station for invasive species, and then get the boats on their way to their next location. Um, so myself and Tori have, have partnered on this before and we'd be happy to help you if you have any interest in that. And then there's also a, a wealth of um, kind of tools and, and equipment out there that can also be purchased uh, for, for use at, at boat ramps and such. All right, so for boaters, uh, there's also what we call kind of good, better, best, and excellent practices. Uh, again, this is specifically for boating today because I work a lot with the recreational boating community, but many of these practices can be adapted for almost any recreational water user. Um, and a lot of times if you're scuba diving or duck hunting, chances are you might be doing it from a boat. So this should also apply to you. So our good practices, and I'm going to hold up some of my equipment here, that I have, for example, um, just to simulate what it would look like if you if you had some uh, equipment in the water and what maybe could be issues with invasive species. So if there's any little kids on, on the webinar today, feel free to put in the chat box where you think invasive species might be found or might get stuck. Um, so a recommendation is cleaning off all visible plants, animals, mud, and debris from all equipment before leaving the water access. So as you see in the pictures here, and I'm going to take my boat trailer off here, um, there's kinds of nooks and crannies in the boat axle, trailer. Um, can you hold it up a little higher, Sarah? Oh, yes, yes, thank you, Alyssa. I can't see myself, so if you can <laughs> This is just kind of a boat trailer here, and um, you can find, I've just got my simulated invasive species here, there's equipment that gets stuck in boat trailers, axles, and all parts of the um, transportation vehicle for a vessel, as well as possible locations on a power boat, for example. If you can see that. Um, live well is a good trick area. Um, even in nets, um, aquatic invasives, uh, anything from animals and vertebrates to plants um, love to get stuck in, in kind of nooks and crannies. So the first good practice is clean. It, it seems very simple, but it's very effective. Just doing a walk around on your vessel, pulling off anything, um, even if it doesn't look like it's alive in invasive species. For example, the mud and debris, 
a lot of our invasives can be almost microscopic. Um, they can be small and they can easily be embedded in that mud and debris. So if you can clean off whatever you, you're able to, drain all water from the motor, bilge, live well, and any other water containing devices. What I like to say is even, you know, if you, if you have a bait bucket, things like that, you wanna dispose of bait properly, but you don't wanna transport that water from place to place. Um, dry everything with a towel before reusing or allow the vessel ideally to sit for five days. Um, the main purpose here is to dry out as much as possible because a lot, again, these are aquatic invasive species, so they need water to survive. But you'd be amazed at how in the, almost a cup of water <laughs> some of these species can survive uh, from transporting from one body of water to the next. So you want to do your best to try and dry it up as much as possible. Um, inspect all equipment, so not just a vessel, again, but live wells. If you have fishing poles, there's um, there's uh, water fleas, there's some um, uh, aquatic uh, organisms that can actually get stuck in fishing line. Um, so you've been kind of inspecting fishing line, make sure there's nothing attached to that. Uh, and then ideally plan and record your efforts so you can document and be aware and, and kind of uh, make it a habit so that this is something you do every single time you leave a body of water to go to a new waterway. Now I will say if you are staying in the same body of water and you're keeping your vessel there, that's fine. This is for, again, if you're transporting um, across to a different watershed or, or something like that. Even better practices are what we call clean, drain, dry, inspect, and record um, with a little bit more emphasis on the cleaning. So cold rinsing boats, trailers, and equipment with a garden hose, even if you have just a, a garden hose available, that's better than nothing. Um, and even better than that is if you have uh, the ability to create a mild bleach solution or a salt solution um, and, and create that, the um, uh, equations are there about a quarter, uh, excuse me, half an ounce per quart of water or two thirds cup of salt solution per gallon of water on all equipment. Um, and again, that would be draining, you know, washing down with a garden hose the outside of the vessel, the outside of a paddle craft, inside where you sit with the paddle craft, then dumping that over um, to really make sure that water is drained out and then letting that dry. Um, if you can do a salt solution inside your live well, um, that also is helpful. So all of those nooks and crannies are great um, best practices for boaters. Even better than those scenarios are a high pressure rinse with a pressure washer and a wash line for boats or trailer. So this is the example that I gave if we were to have a fishing tournament and we actually set up what you see in these pictures here, a power wash station. Um, this is fairly common in a lot of areas across the country and it's a high pressure washer, but it's not too high where it's, it's not gonna, um, you know, pull off any of the paint or any of the decals on the vessel. It's simply high enough to remove invasive species, especially um, some tricky invasives like uh, zebra mussel, quagga mussel, veliger larvae, um, plants, uh, roots and stuff that really gets stuck and embedded in certain parts of the boat or the axle of the trailer um, and, and truly give a good effective clean uh, so that these species don't get spread. The last exceptional practice, the best case scenario, would be a hot pressure rinse. So not just high pressure um, to make sure that you're really pushing those invasive species out of those nooks and crannies, but a hot pressure rinse. And that um, is demonstrated to show that it's uh, fairly effective at, at removing and, and um, essentially decreasing the chance of any of these species surviving. So a note here, just a disclaimer, always follow directions and get guidance. The Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers website that was shared with you has a whole um, very detailed list of resources and instructions uh, based on which type of best practice you're doing and also based on user group. Um, so whether you're a power boater, paddler, scuba driver, etc. Um, so we encourage you to find out more or contact us if you are interested in um, doing something like a boat wash station and we're happy to help you kind of put together an outline or a guide or a plan for how to do that.
All right, this is something a little bit more basic. Um, it's a great recommendation and, and we've created um, what we call clean boating kits for a couple different uh, applications, marine debris, pollution prevention. This is an aquatic invasive species prevention kit. Um, so I've kind of grabbed, honestly, went to my garage and, and got, got some supplies here. And most of this you should be able to gather from around the house, um, but it's what we would recommend kind of throwing together. If you know you're going to be going out on the water somewhere and then you know you're going to be at some point then traveling to a new body of water. Um, so a flashlight is helpful, especially if you're um, going to be trailering in or out in those early morning or late evening hours. We need to be able to see better. Um, so that's a good recommendation really to have um, to inspect and get a good look at any of those nooks and crannies. Um, really make sure you're getting, like if you need to look in the live well, um, see if there's any visible invasives in there and they can be pretty small. You'd be amazed at how tiny these things get and how again they survive in a very small amount of water. Um, a bait bag. This is a great um, example here, but it's it's essentially a you know plastic bag um, that you can use to dispose of unused bait. Um, the key is it's just like firewood. Um, you don't want to transport firewood, so you don't want to transport um, invasive species or any unused bait as well. You want to buy bait locally and use it locally, and that's the best practice. You don't know. Um, maybe yes, there's some species that are. Um, from one body of water that may also be found in another body of water, but you're not ever 100% sure of that. So we recommend buy bait locally, use bait locally, dispose of what you don't use. Don't ever take bait and transport it and use it somewhere else. You could be accidentally introducing an invasive species. Uh, a boat brush. Um, so this is something that Honestly, it was like a tire brush, that I had. Um, but it can work as well. Um, what this is is to help if you just have a garden hose. Um, this can really be effective. That kind of if if you have a vessel that's been in the water for a little while and you are taking it to a new body of water, this can help scrape off um, some of the algae and kind of scum that'll get attached to the boat really break loose that debris or um, mud or dirt what have you and get any invasive species that may be attached to that um, off as well um, so that's a great application if you just have a brush like this uh, again with the clean marinas program we have some of these and resources available that we could loan out to you if you're interested in doing um, and again, for, for a tournament or an event where you'd have a lot of vessels um, at once exiting a body of water and going to a new body of water. So we could help you with that. A chamois towel. We also, some of you that may be familiar with our programming, have these great clean, drain, dry um, invasive species towels, but any chamois will do, or just a towel that you have, you know, kind of an old rag around the house. The idea behind this is clean, drain, dry. Um, so this can help you with drying. Once you've cleaned off with a garden hose all the way up to a power washer, um, once you've drained uh, bait buckets, live wells, um, your bilge, now you want to dry. So if you don't have the ability for drying for five days, this can at least, um, or any larger towel, whatever you have around, go around the vessel, go around whatever equipment that you have, do your best to dry it out or, or dry it off so that it, um, this actually just helps absorb water, so maybe it'll dry quicker and you won't have to let it sit for five days if you don't have that time. All right, a sponge. Um, this is a great idea uh, to get inside the live well or bait buckets or any areas where there's pools of water and it's difficult to get with a cup or to have a drain plug available. Um, so if you just get a large sponge, um, that can easily you know, soak up the water and again, remove that water get as, as little water left as possible, again, so that evaporation and the towel, you can have uh, best case scenario for drying everything out. Um, the other things that are listed up here are an aqua weed stick. These are things that you would likely have to buy, but they're helpful tools if you do travel around a lot. Um, this is helpful for, for scraping and pulling out weeds. Uh, a plug wrench to assist in removing drain plugs or to, um, make sure it holds on. It's kind of like a um, 
almost like a carabine or a lanyard so that uh, when you pull your drain plug it, it stays attached to that so you don't lose your drain plug. That's something you never want to have happen. <laughs> so um, these are just some good tools. Again, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you put together some kits or, or come up with other ideas for an event you may be having or for a, a typical scenario that you have where you're going from one body of water to the next frequently. All right, I'm going to end here now with some resources. Uh, these are broader on our invasive species uh, specific topics as well as our clean boating topics. So you can find more about the Ohio Clean Marina and the clean boater programs on our, our Clean Marina's website. Again, the AIS field guide that Tori mentioned, the link is there, and I believe Alyssa put that in. Um, we also have an aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes fact sheet. That's a great, um, just brief resource for learning more about what invasives are and why it's important. We do our part to prevent their spread and introduction. Um, our best practices for boaters YouTube video, that's part of our clean boater YouTube series. And then for anybody that does, if, if you know of or if you interact quite a bit with um, fishing tournaments, there's a clean boats, clean tournaments uh, resources and website. And that video mentioned here uh, really goes into detail on how to plan for a boat wash station um, at, at a fishing tournament. Uh, and again, we, we've got some experience doing this with groups across Ohio, and we're happy to help plan for this type of setup um, if that's something you're interested in. We appreciate everybody who is doing their part. Uh, it's really important, as Tori kind of mentioned, to stay um, vigilant on this. We have a lot of invasive species already in Ohio, but the way I always explain it is um, these practices should become habit because while yes, we already have invasives here and we certainly want to do our part to prevent those invasives from spreading elsewhere in places where they are not yet, um, it's also really important that we prevent new invasive species from coming in. And yes, you know, we have zebra mussels, we have the invasive carp to be worried about, um, but who knows what the next invasive will be. And if we can do our part to prevent the spread and get this become a habit, we'll all be involved in preventing the next invasive from coming in. Um, so it's not only helping those current invasives, it's helping the new invasives. So in my mind, it's something no matter what invasive you're talking about, these are just good practices that should be a part of our lifestyle as being responsible water users. So we appreciate your help with that. and. With that, I will throw back to Alyssa in case we have questions, but I'm going to leave up this webinar series slide to remind you that there are more webinars um, coming in future weeks. Yeah, yeah Sarah, Sarah, we have, we have one, one great, great question. question. Um, um, a uh, uh, viewer said, I'm a middle school science teacher in Southwest Ohio. I teach an ecology unit that's based on the study of invasive species and my students complete a research project on an Ohio invasive organism. My question is, do you ever do virtual presentations for schools? Absolutely, and I'll stop sharing so that you can see Tori as well. Um, Tori and I both, we can do virtual presentations, and then we also, Tori, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have what's called an aquatic invasive species attack pack, which is a really cool portable backpack that we can loan out um, to educators. And it's pretty neat because it actually has preserved specimens of invasive species that the kids love to interact with. Um, so yes, you'd be welcome to contact us. I'll see if I can maybe put my contact information in the Q&A if that's possible. I actually, I sent her your email. Perfect, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> reach out to us and, and I'll let Tori speak as well, but we're happy to help, so. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I actually replied, uh, replied privately as well, so. I think she's she's covered, but everybody else, if you're a teacher, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Yep. And and I think that wraps it up, Sarah, but I'll pass it back to you in case you, in case you have any closing remarks. No, I think that's good. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you'll uh, join us in future webinar series. And again, feel free to contact us if you want to learn more about anything invasive species in Ohio. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your Wednesday.